but basically less than 5% of the Americans are prepared to survive for more than 30 days. Whatever it is, whatever you're preparing for, whatever happens, we're just going to call it the event for the rest of this discussion. So, you have to stop and think of what's going to happen or what other people are going to do post-event. And that's what my discussion tonight is going to be about. But before we get too far along, I've got a couple of questions I want to ask everybody. Let's do it by show of hands. How many people here got a deer license last year? Okay. How many, keep your hands up. How many people here have been hunting or can go deer hunting if they wanted to or would get a license if they could, if they wanted to? How many people have the equipment, the knowledge, the know-how, but just haven't pulled a ticket or gone deer hunting in years? Okay, I want you guys to look around at all the hands that are up in the air. Um, you've got to look at the number. We're looking at close to a five to one ratio. Put your hands down. You're looking at a five to one ratio of people that buy a deer tag ticket to those that don't, that have the means and the capability. Do you understand the difference between the two? Give me a couple nods. Yes. Okay. That's a real important point for something I want to point out to you. Take our little book here. <clears throat> Look at our little book, which I don't have a whiteboard, so you have to think along with me a little bit here. <clears throat> Pittsburgh, Erie, Youngstown, Sharon, Warren, all the way up to Cleveland, Painesville, Mentor, Columbus, Cambridge, Zanesville. That area in through there. You forgot Akron, where we're standing. And oh yeah, in dead center, Akron. Akron Canton, Massillon adding all that in. In that area alone, the year that I saw the stats for, 1.24 million deer tags were issued for people to live within that area. So stop and think about that for a minute. That's not deers taken. That's not hunting licenses. That's deer tags issued, which in Pennsylvania and Ohio both is the second tag. 1.2 more than 1.2 million deer tags issued. That stat alone should almost make you stop and take notice. Because I want you to think about that. Three days after the trucks stopped running and there's no food left in the grocery stores. Because basically, let's say event happens, it's Monday. By Wednesday, the shelves are going to be picked clean everywhere. Depending on how panicked everybody gets. If it's a localized regional event, maybe not so much because they can bring food and stuff in from other areas. But grocery stores today only have three days worth of food maximum sitting on their shelves. And that's called the just-in-time delivery system. Whether you're going to Walmart, Big Chicken, Giant Eagle, Costco, wherever you're going to buy your food, for the most part, there's a three-day supply sitting on the shelves. That's, that's the number. On Monday the 1st, it happens whatever the event is, and by Monday the 14th, the 15th, two weeks later, everybody's completely out of food except for us. And that raises a whole lot of other concerns, not just about A, how do I feed my family, because that's what we're here trying to figure out, <coughs> but B, how do I protect my family, and what's the logic behind making some of those decisions it is to that point. I think the most critical point of why we're all here it is that in order for us to survive to the 30 day point or the 60 day point, you gotta make it through the first 14 days. Now we all have bug out bags, we all have 72 hour kits. We all have a couple of weeks worth of food in our emergency stash at minimum. And that's great, that's a good start. But that's not gonna get you to the point that other people that are the bad guys will have died off or have moved on. Let me explain what I'm talking about. Let's talk about Bob and Joe, two imaginary guys that live on a cul-de-sac around the corner. Bob and Joe are like the people here that raised their hands. For the most part, they have a couple of guns. They hunted as kids or with their parents, and they know a little bit about the woods. They just haven't been deer hunting in several years, but they have the means, they have the capability, and they have the knowledge. 
What more? They're not afraid to try it. These are the guys that pull a deer tag and will hunt for five years and never see a deer. Because they don't know how to walk through the woods quietly or they just don't get it. They don't get that you can't go out at noon and go deer hunting smelling like beer and not come home with a deer by four. Think about them. They each have a couple of kids, they're married. They live here on the outskirts of Akron and something happens on Monday, the event happens. Their kids are hungry by Thursday. If it's something where we're all stuck at home and we're not even going to work and we're hunkered in at our house, those kids are gonna be hungry for anything to entertain them mentally, emotionally, and physically. They're gonna be looking for food. There's not going to be anything that you can spare for them to go make cookies. You're not gonna be able to pop popcorn and make everybody happy for an hour. And you're not gonna be able to turn on the VCR and let them watch a movie, let's say, if it's an EMP situation. Whatever the case is, whatever the situation is, you have to think of how their families are going to react. Hence, those two guys that are living on the cul-de-sac are gonna hook up with a couple of their buddies that live nearby, and they're gonna go find a piece of woods, and they're gonna be the men and supply the food to feed the family because that's what Daniel Boone did. And that's what Jeremiah Johnson did. So we'll call this the Jeremiah Johnson effect. They're gonna walk into the woods thinking they've got their brand new Henry rifle, and they're gonna walk into the woods and go kill Bambi and feed their family, and they're gonna live happily ever after wearing a coonskin cap. They're delusional. They're not going to make it. They're not prepared. Statistically, the odds of them making it past the first 30 days is staggeringly low. They're either going to get shot in the woods, because after the first day of them being out there trying to actually kill a deer, they're going to realize that they didn't see a deer, so maybe they should shoot that raccoon or the bunnies they see. By the third day of their quote-unquote big guy hunting trip to the woods to feed their family, they're not going to go home without food, so they're going to kill anything that moves. They see a dog, they're killing it. They see a cat, they're killing it. They see a cow, they're killing it. They see anything walking anywhere, they're gonna kill it and bring it home because they're gonna feed their family something. Because by the third day of out there being walking through the woods, realizing that their kids are home starving, they're gonna do anything. They're gonna start to get desperate. And it's that desperateness that we're talking about here. Just do the math on this. Remember our little map? If we're looking at a five to one ratio, that's in excess of five million people that live in our basic area, they're gonna walk into the woods to try to feed their families. They are not gonna be able to do it. And they're gonna move like a herd of locusts. And they're gonna go from wherever they can to wherever they can find anything to kill and eat. And that's the people we gotta be worried about. How do you deal with that? That's where the urban prepping comes in. You know, everybody that thinks you're going to go out and go fishing and hunting and you're going to feed yourself <laughs> with five million people following you into the woods, even if my stats are off by half, that's two and a half million people out there trying to kill deer. Hence, the food storage. That's why I push personally having so much not freeze-dried food, not, you know, fancy kits and things and MREs to eat, but real food, like we're putting together in the food program. This is the food that will sustain you for the first six months or longer. Because depending on what the event is that happens, like if you guys remember from uh, my food talk I did before about uh, the big black luggers of canned goods, you're gonna wanna grab those canned goods and bring them up into your kitchen and go into those canned goods to feed your family for the first couple of weeks. And let me explain to you why you wanna eat that food versus anything else, okay? That's the food you eat first. You're gonna eat the SpaghettiOs, you're gonna eat the chunky soup, you're gonna eat the, you know, whatever comes in the can. The can of Spain, the can of tuna. Here's why. As kids, we all remember coming home, <coughs> your mom was baking bread, you can smell that bread walking down the street before you've got in the house. She had a pot roast in the oven, or a turkey in the oven. And as you were walking into the house, before you even got in the door, you could smell what dinner was and you were so hungry by the time you got in the door. That same effect is what's going to happen to all of us when we're trying to break out our storage goods and bake bread. Roast a turkey or roast a chicken or roast anything we, we kill. We kill a cat on the corner. We want to roast it so we can eat it. That smell of that food cooking is going to permeate your home 
and just draw a half mile loop around your house. Because that's how far that smell is going to travel. And let me tell you, people that are hungry will smell that smell and will follow their nose. So your OPSEC, your logic in order to hunker down in your home in an urban situation is that you don't want to turn on your stove and your oven to cook anything because you don't want the smell leaving your house. You don't, even though you have the means of baking fresh bread or making a big pot of chili, you don't want to do that because in the time that it cooks, you just advertise to everybody within a half mile radius of your house what you're doing and what you have. Go back to our two guys in the cul-de-sac. Those same two guys, now they're in a cul-de-sac trying to feed their kids, are out trying to kill anything they can to feed them when they get home. Odds are they're coming home empty-handed, or per practically empty-handed. What would be the next thing they do? They come to your house. They're going to go anywhere they can to find food, because that's what a man would do to take care of his family. He would go out and do anything he possibly could to feed his family. Who wants to go home and see their children sitting on the couch crying because they're hungry? We're talking about urban prepping has to be how to deal with the 95% of the people who do not prep. And what is your logical situation of how to deal with them and overcome them in the short term, and then the midterm, and then the long term? And that's how you need to put your plans together. For example, I talked about bringing up a big case of food setting it up on the ground in front of your kitchen. And then you're eating out of that. All that food that's in those cans is pre-cooked. You can eat it right out of the can if you had to. So the people next door are already over asking for food and you've told them you don't have any, the last thing you want to do is fire up your stove and put on a can, a pot of something that they can smell. Because now they caught you in a lie. And as they get desperate, they'll either burn you out, shoot you, get together as a mob and come steal everything you have. And God only knows what. It's it's not movie theory, this is reality. If you guys haven't read a book called uh, One Second After, I truly recommend you read it. But pay attention not just to the book itself, <clears throat> but to the forward and the postscript after. You know, the things that are always written by other people about the book, that are always in the paperback. Be like a short story in the beginning and a short story at the end. I recommend that book most of all to all of you to read. Because the guy that wrote the book was the ghost pen for Newt Gingrich when he wrote a lot of his history books. And the guys that write the forwards and who gave information and technical information to the, to the book as he was writing it, wrote the book for the military on how to survive an EMP pulse. A lot of that stuff is classified and they couldn't talk about it. Um, this was their way to talk about it. They wrote it as a fictional story. So. It's a really good book to read, highly recommend it. It'll get you thinking of how to survive the first 365 days, which is what this book does. It takes them through the first year of life. Because this is kind of a basic point you really have to think about when you're thinking bushcraft, living on the farm, to living in the city. Everybody thinks the best idea is going to be to gather your stuff and run to the woods. Well, it may not be, because depending on how, what lives around you and how many woods you actually have to go hide in or places to go to, there may be a couple million other people thinking the same thing, and that's not going to be the place to be. But you have another issue. If you're inner city, the urban centers are going to become death traps. So if you live inner city, have a plan to survive that first 30 days, and good luck. Because if you're not on the first wave getting out of the inner city, you may be better to hunker down and, and ride them out. And think of it this way, they're going to move through the cities looking to take anything they can steal, anything they can find. Probably for the first day or two, it's going to be TV screens and uh, Xboxes, because they're not going to get what's going on. I.e., look at Katrina. If you remember watching the newscast when Katrina first came ashore, I remember laughing my hind end off at watching some guy, two guys carry this big Hitachi <laughs> rear screen projection TV, and while they had bows, ear earplugs on, dragging... Basically, less than 5% of the Americans are prepared to survive more than 30 days.